I think the government had, has to have more, must take the onus in actually communicating the true facts. And I think they've not been very proactive in communicating the entire thing. The protests over the Citizenship Amendment Act show no signs of abating. People, especially students, commoners, intellectuals, Bollywood stars, opposition parties are all up in arms against this law. On the other hand, we have the government that have refused to repeal the law or make changes to it. The ministers from the government have spoken, but at some point they have failed to articulate their side of the story and win over the people. In this context, Business Line catches up with Mr. Chopin Das Gupta, a Rajya Sabha MP, a presidential nominee to be more specific, and a BJP member who was also a part of the Joint Parliamentary Committee that drafted the Citizenship Amendment Bill of 2016, which is now the CAA. In this interview, here in Kolkata, Mr. Das Gupta speaks about the contentious and much maligned CAA, the prospects of the BJP in Bengal, and an incident at the Vishwa Bharati where he had to face mob protests for nearly six hours. Vishwa Bharati that day, maybe two to, two to three days back, and what is your take on that entire scenario? Well, I had gone to Vishwa Bharati on the invitation of the Vice Chancellor to give a talk on the Citizenship Amendment Act as part of their university lecture series. I'd spoken earlier also in part of the university lecture series. And uh, and the reason why they chose me was partly because, as you mentioned, I had written exhaustively on the question and partly because I was a member of that parliamentary committee. Um, now, on the day of the function, shortly before the time, the venue, which was the main university auditorium, had been blocked by students intent on preventing me from going and delivering the lecture. But before the event, the, uh, the vice chancellor thought it prudent to shift the venue rather than have, trigger a confrontation. And the venue was shifted to another place and uh, the lecture was delivered to a crowd of about 300 students, come faculty, come employees, and maybe a few outsiders. Towards the fag end of the lecture, a group of people shouting slogans wanted to storm the building, whereupon the university security people shut the gates. So they more or less surrounded the building and uh, prevented us from leaving for about six hours. He kept up that siege. Now we could have left, we could have forced our way out, but that would have meant ugly scenes, could have possibly meant violence. And uh, the unfortunate scenes which we saw in the case in Jadavpur involving Babul Supriyo was paramount in our mind. Another possibility was to call the police, but you know, that's a, always a complicating factor in any campus. So I think the best point was we just waited. And uh, finally, when a combination of pressure and good sense uh, prevailed, and uh, it was out. So I, I think what, what, what I find uh, a little disturbing is not that there were protests, of course. I mean, people have every right to protest. I think the intent of the people was to disrupt the lecture. Now the Vice Chancellor had made it very clear that he wanted various other people who had different points of view to attend, to be part of the platform and give their views. But uh, they a lot of them decided that no, they will not share a platform with me. Now this sort of no platform business is the height of intolerance. It's, it's an epidemic which has been spreading in large parts of the world, and I'm not saying India is the only place. Uh, and I think it's very unfortunate. So, uh, so all in all, I think this was a very unfortunate incident. Uh, naturally, the follow-up question that comes in mind on this is, how do you see the entire situation in the country, particularly play out post the implementation or rollout of Citizenship Amendment Act. There's a huge division of opinion. There's a yes, there's a no, there's a neutral. But right now, it seems that there are, there are violence. That's the, 
are you happy with the way the thing is playing out especially when you were a part of the committee which worked on these legislation i think it's based on a couple of misunderstanding firstly the first paramount misunderstanding is that the citizenship amendment act deprives certain people of citizenship the ca has no power to take away anybody's citizenship it is only to grant and more important to fast track a certain process of citizenship to those who may either be either legal refugees or maybe in case in large cases on west bengal maybe illegal immigrants secondly it's also the linkage between and uh, the citizenship amendment thing which grants citizenship to and yet to be designed for nrc which is actually meant for identifying who are citizens and who are illegal immigrants in this country so this linkage in my view is also unfortunate but the linkage also has taken place in the light of the experience of the nrc in assam which was supreme court monitored and regulated and which in hindsight has turned out to be horribly flawed finally i would say that the entire business of identifying or actually codifying indian citizens in this country is an overdue project but it's a project which needs exhaustive consultation because india is a very largely under documented place most citizens do not have or may or may not have uh, the necessary documentation and secondly some of that documentation may be rather suspect in nature so these are facts which are well known and it also has to take into account what do we do with people who are found to be patently illegal immigrants that also is a question so these are issues which have to be deliberated debated it hasn't come to parliament and the parliament uh, and the prime minister made it very clear that it hasn't even gone to cabinet it's an idea nrc you're nrc you talk about nrc it hasn't even gone to cabinet nrc has become a shorthand for identifying the process illegal immigrants but actually there is no nrc in yes. in in place so i think the combination of all these factors has cluttered the situation and there's been a lot of misinformation disinformation partial information and the whole atmosphere has got very foggy in this context um, for some reason do you not feel the bjp has not done enough Uh, or the or the center has not done enough to come out and say very openly that nrc and caa are not linked do you think something more was required for it i think communication has been imperfect in a lot of ways by uh, i think the government had has to have more must take the onus in actually communicating the true facts and i think they've not been very proactive in communicating the entire thing uh as a result of which a lot of particularly in the state of west bengal i've noticed considerable amount of scaremongering half baked information people asking how do we have to prove our citizenship you know questions which are actually not very relevant or are not pertinent to to this but those have come in so yes you are very right in saying that the entire de- debate has been clouded by imperfect information emanating from all sides so i think that clarity which should have been there has not been there. and what is even further complicating the matter is that the media in this case has turned out to be extremely partisan in various ways so they 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 basically it's become this whole business has become a uh, issue to sort of say let's teach narendra modi and amit shah who got too big for their boots after the victory in the general election let's cut them down to size 
and these are issues. And finally, and this is a more complex question, a large section of the Muslim community felt that they had lost political, not only political power, but also political influence post-2014. And they also felt that their voice no longer mattered after the triple talaq bill, after the Supreme Court judgment on the Ayodhya case, and after the abrogation of 370 in Kashmir and the subsequent division of the state. So there was a feeling in the Muslim community that we have lost political influence. And a, a influential section of them decided this was a good way of trying to reclaim some lost ground and try to assert, to, to inform the political establishment that we too matter quite a lot. And this was the occasion to use it. So, it, so as you can see, a lot of different cross currents played a role in generating all this heat and dust over the Citizenship Amendment Act. So did the BJP not see a sort of a, let's say, uh, sort of a rising uprising, let's put it this way, people's uprising against the CA? Did they fail to gauge the... I think, the, the I, I, I think you're probably right in saying that uh, the BJP underestimated the potential opposition, partly because, you know, this year, I mean, the whole citizenship thing has been under discussion from 2016, and there was opposition. But that opposition was in Assam and the Northeast. And that was a very specific type of opposition. And much of that opposition, which was expressed, and, you know, the parliamentary committee met large numbers of people, delegations from Assam and other other northeastern states. And a lot of those concerns were accommodated in the bill which was play, placed before parliament in 2019. So if you read the 2016 bill and 2019 bill, the, the major difference you'll find is that how much of the northeast and Assam concerns have actually been accommodated in, in, in those. So that part. But the type of concerns which are being articulated now were not really expressed at that time. So I think, yes, you might say there was a failure of anticipation, or you can say that these protests, the concerns which are now being mounted, are post facto. So whichever it is, I think one of the biggest shortcomings of the BJP in this context was that this was essentially a legislation which was primarily aimed at tying up some of the loose ends of the partition in eastern India. This was the principal focus of this. The other parts are really very small. And the education and so who are the beneficiaries, what are the reasons for it, etc. And why the East, this is the principal, the beneficiary of these are the Bengalis, Hindus from East, uh, Bangladesh principally who came after 1972, I think the local West Bengal BJP, I think, failed strikingly in getting these concerns expressed. And I think they were very slow to react. And uh, I don't think they, were, they matched up to, to the task which was expected. And they have a formidable opponent in the form of Mamta Banerjee, who's who saw this as a great way of regaining lost ground after the general election. And yeah, she had had a big jolt in the general election. So she saw this as a very, very good opportunity. And like a good politician, she capitalized on it with gusto. Um, naturally, then, when, when we talk of this sort of a uprising, so do you think there's a re there needs to, uh, although I know the act has been notified uh, yesterday, I think, even as we speak, it's now an act, official act. Do you still feel there is, or do you see there's a scope for a repeal or some remodification in the act to calm down fears that are now being raised? No, not in the act. The only, there are two possible ways. One is you say, 
we will not grant any more citizen any citizenship in eastern india two you can say there is a complete amnesty for all illegal immigrants which is which is the subtext of what mamta banerjee is saying that all are welcome that you are no longer going to make religious discrimination in bangladesh the criterion for this that anybody who's come in that okay anybody who's come in for whatever reason is going to be accommodated and made indian citizens if they want to be indian citizens i don't think if if that happens you will have assam going up in flames and you will have a communal situation in this part of the country which will be even far more so i think ultimately <coughs> i don't think there's any modification possible in the citizenship amendment act the larger question which i think we have to talk about is ultimately what do we do with people who are patently illegal atal bihari bajpai had proposed a sort of a green card system whereby people have rights but they don't have voting rights right which is a concern very which is a very big concern in assam particularly about how certain illegal immigrant groups have acquired voting rights and are using it as a form of political veto that is also a concern in some of the districts of west bengal and this is a very quiet murmur which is always there all over and it has it can be shared the atmosphere considerably so that we have to think about that and i think that calls for a very very serious debate a dispassionate debate a calm debate but a very serious debate because this is ultimately we have to ask ourselves do we regulate the borders do we otherwise we have open borders can we manage open borders it will be quite a crazy situation in india to have open borders so can we regulate borders so the entire process which started from border fencing and you know which has not been perfect i mean under no circumstances has it been perfect but the process has started the fact that you are delineating borders so you you can understand the transition of india from a position where the artificial borders after partition creation of some sort of a demarcation passports and visas now you are moving towards a situation and this is not something which can happen overnight it has something to it's, it's got to happen but we, you have to start somewhere and it's got to be done seriously not only with an idea of who benefits electorally but do we have that atmosphere of debate in the country at this present well, you've got to have it you've got to have it here serious issues as much as is possible of course you don't have it at present we don't have it but you've got to somehow do it because these are very very serious questions which are being raised at every point and uh, you know this might be a, you may not get a resolution of it straight away but you've got to keep at it i mean as it is that every various parts of india which were part of an unorganized sector are being brought into an organized sector and i think you can talk about the how the bank accounts the aadhar everything is getting the whole from gst also what was in the you know casually ill defined etc you're trying to bring it within a, a structure and an order and this national the question of nationality citizenship is also part of that larger process and it has lot of loose ends so i like to view this whole thing from a very different perspective i mean of course there are the political compulsions you can't escape from it but beyond that it's part of this larger process and i wish that okay while people engage in their political discussions they also take these into account in bringing out in confronting this problem and and you know it's something which has been going on for a long time i mean it started right from the assam agitation in the 80s the those were the actual themes 
So they've got to be addressed at some point. And how long can we go? Do we have agitation after agitation after agitation to resolve it? I think the CAA was an attempt. I think it was a very noble, bold and audacious attempt to at least come to terms with some of these questions, which is why I, I support it quite resolutely. I don't believe it's the last word. I believe this is just a big, it's a big step. Then I mentioned much more. But nobody's talking about that. They're saying no, they're talking about the repeal of the CA. Uh, so we just go back to one of the questions we started with. That was intolerance in the student community mm -hmm. or intolerance to share diocese. So like if I look at the chronology of events happening in Bengal today, it's Babul Shukriyo at Jadavpur University, Governor Dhankar at again Jadavpur University, disinviting or uninviting the governor from various invitations and then you at Vishwabharati, which is a central university. For some reason, are you not foreseeing a, or are you not seeing a situation where the BJP has eliminated either the student community and the urban youth from its voter base because of the CA or the failure to communicate about CA? I have spoken at various functions and in universities. I don't believe this is a national phenomenon, firstly. I'm going to speak in, next week I'm speaking in IIM Bangalore. I've got invitations to speak in almost all these various places which have disinvited. It's a, it's a phenomenon which is specific to certain institutions in Bengal. And I believe it's a problem which is associated principally with a declining left. A declining left which is also becoming an increasingly more militant left. So there's a sort of a curious correspond, uh, uh, inverse relationship. The more it gets popular, electoral legitimacy, the more it becomes more accommodating. The less the electoral popularity of the left, the more it becomes <laughs> rigid and the hardcore. And this is what we are seeing at, at this point. Uh, and this, but you know, the curious feature of it is, as I, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's not confined to India. It's this whole business of no platforming, which is, which is becoming an epidemic in many of the Western universities as well, that people whose views you don't agree with are deemed to be views which are illegitimate. Okay. So this is, it's that phenomenon. I mean, university is supposed to be a place where you, you know, debate your views, you know, of course you heckle and you shout and that's part of the game. But at the end of the day, you don't prevent thought from permeating. You don't create what are being called safe zones. Intellectual safe zones where there's no challenge. And this is, this is a lesson which should be learned from both the right and the left. I'm not sort of blaming exclusively the left. I mean, look, the right traditionally has been not so much of a theoretical model as models which are based on experience, people's experiences and what is called common sense. That's the, that's the basis on which what is called right ideology is made. Left, on the other hand, is a little more doctrinal. Now, the interplay between these two are part, this is what has kept society going for a long time. And I, if you're going to suddenly put a curve on this, it's, it, it's going to be terrible. And I, I, I personally feel that, you know, this sort of witch hunt and all that sort of thing, it's, it's a, apart from anything, it's extremely petty and it doesn't serve any purpose. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saddened more than, more, more than angry by this. Um, coming to Bengal, as a member of the BJP and being active in Bengal for quite some time, over the, let's say, last five, seven years, uh, you personally, do you see that the CA will bring in the necessary political dividends to the party for 2021? No, I've been active in Bengal, actually not for five years. I've been active in Bengal ever since the Prime Minister told me to be a little more active there, since about uh, September of 2018. Uh, what I find in Bengal is that the BJP belongs to a national party, which is quite an old party. And it's probably a dominant party in, in many various parts of the country. But in Bengal, it's an extremely new party. 
it's like a startup we say it's 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 a different it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of it's a it's an old club which suddenly got massive traction and the process of digesting that success is still underway probably needs a little bit of digestives to help the process and it i think the in the in interplay between those who've been in the party have a comfortable club like existence for 30 40 years accustomed to losing deposits and between those who've come in and sort of seems that okay this is the platform to power that integration is still underway not had complete so as a result of that i think there's a lot of more homework which the bengal party has got to do and um, I, 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 um, you know uh, it's a, a assembly election and a lok sabha election are two different in a lok sabha election you can write piggy back on narendra modi which they did it was a vote for modi they said look when in and in, in, in the center we want this guy but when it comes to the assembly election challenges are far more formidable because you have a big leader in the form of mamta banerji she leads a powerful regional party she decimated the mighty left so you can see the aura the charisma which is thing okay there's a lot of uh her government's performance has been not up to expectation it's been marred by a great degree of uh, localized corruption it's been marred by indifferent performance at various points but she's also a great one for publicity she's always at it you know <laughs> the the sort of the personality cult she has built around herself sometimes works sometimes there's a backlash against it so we don't know exactly what will happen at this time but at the moment she's created a furore over over ca just people whether they know about it or not they think that something it's either something terrible or something very intriguing is happening she's mobilized the entire muslim community and got them over to its side so electorally which means that if she gets about 50 if if she gets about 10% or 12% incremental votes from other communities she can actually sail through that's also a interesting point which you've got to note so under the circumstances the bjp has to sit back reflect think about it go about and in a very very systematic way about how a strategy for west bengal will be done now there are two approaches to that what is you built a build an organization brick by brick somehow i think that the time for that is over the second point is you create enough of a hawa as they say and get it to together so i think under the circumstances i think the hawa approach is probably now but what will create the hawa you can't you can't bank on modi and amit shah to do that because they are not going to be players in the assembly election and that's quite clear so here you've got to develop a bengali leadership you've got to have people who can appeal to different sections of the population right from the villages to the to the emo informed bhadralok section to the uh, tribal community so those are the things one one thing i'd like to put a point out in very interesting is that if you look at the successes of the bjp in 2019 you'll find that the successes are all what is called the periphery of bengal that is you they want north bengal they want jungle mahals right. they want the tribal communities but they fail to get the heart of the bhadralok constituencies the urban constituencies the urban constituencies the old sort of the heart of bengal southern bengal etc they fail miserably and that failure is once again even now when you look at the how the mobilization along the ca has been done that those still remain mamta stronghold but the the pro caa mobilizations in the periphery purulia north bengal bakura they been very impressive for the bjp's point of view so that mismatch still continues and so fine uh, finally a very large question 
let's say putting it in a theoretical perspective do you see the gap between the left that's the left school of thought and the right school of thought widening over time in india and globally that's one and a follow up to that is in the context of india the left says their thought of india is one the right says their thought of india is the nationalistic view yeah in this context are they both not on the same platform at some and then yet different see the first thing which is there is that the left has so far had the monopoly of intellectual discourse in a large sort of way when i say left i mean variations of it from the moderate to to the more extreme left and that's because they've had access to the centers of intellectual capital in india now this has changed the bjp won elections whether it was bajpai and subsequently narendra modi not because of any intellectual support but despite the absence of it so you've got to realize that there were two different types what is called the right in india is still a very small group and they certainly don't have much of a presence in the traditional centers of intellectual power what also passes up at the right is a more technocratic approach so that that is a default position of people who are not left therefore you're saying they're right, right as opposed to those who are consciously part of that now the one one of the more interesting features which has happened in re- recent times is a that a section of the left and a section of the muslim community has shared its earlier misgivings over things like the constitution the national flag the national anthem etc and have moved on to what might be only called a more nehruvian uh, plank so there, there there has been a certain shift in that from the dictatorship of the proletariat to the <laughs> to to nehru is is, is suddenly to at least a form of the old fashioned democratic socialism model you know social democratic model there is certainly a shift and i think we we see that whereas what constitutes the right takes into account the old nationalist heritage the pre nehru nationalist heritage that's the basis on which the, this is built but how do you build it from there so i think there is a, a, a formidable intellectual challenge now for a very long time the rss shunned any form of intellectual endeavor rss is important partly because they are a large organized force and they have a lot of resources they have a lot of people but move, the good thing is that by moving away from this disdain for intellectualism to actually saying no no that is also very important and we must do our bit at least you are getting some sort of a churning in india and this churning is important because i think the indian right if that's the word to be called or call it you know if some people call it nationalist thought some you know basically you're saying which is which is a departure from the left that is still work in progress serious work i mean the work in progress is quite there because there is for a long time since about the 1950s to now there's been a void the so that void thoughts. yeah that void has got to be filled up you need a coherent view on the economy you need i mean both sides need coherent views on the economy then you need to you know but the central question which is the debate which is going on is a question of na- how do we define nationhood what is the basis on which nationhood and then that schism will remain always because we are talking about from two very different positions but overall i would say there is a debate in india it's a healthy debate it should go on because uh, if electoral politics is backed up also by a good robust intellectual debate it's healthy i think that shows as a democracy we are coming of age i think and that's why despite being troubled in some ways i'm also very optimistic about the whole future